pray. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for all you do for us, Lord. I ask that um, this morning that the words that are spoken are not my words, Lord, but that they're the Spirit of God's. I, I don't deserve to stand behind this pulpit. You know that. But Lord, your word deserves to be preached. Your truths deserve to be proclaimed. Lord, I ask that you'd help me to do that this morning. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would break down any wall that we might have up in our hearts. Lord, that uh, you might break every chain this morning, that you would work in our hearts, that you might have free reign in our lives, in our minds. Lord, put every thought out of our mind except yours. Thank you for meeting with us this morning. I ask that you oversee the hour. Amen. Matthew chapter 16. We're going to look down in verse 24. Verse 24, the Bible says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of, the fa- of his Father with the angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. Now turn with me, if you will, over to Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians 3, and we'll start in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. These here are tough verses. They're tough verses because the one thing that is the hardest for us to do in life is to deny self. To be willing to deny self. And I speak from personal experience as well. It's hard for me to tell me no. We have we work a job at the end of the week we get a paycheck and usually we end up working a job that gives us enough to do whatever we want. We budget properly. And so most of the time I don't have to tell myself no. But it's it's good to make a practice of telling yourself no. Because the Bible is very clear about <clears throat> that we should deny ourselves. We should deny ourselves. It, it goes against human nature. Because we as humans are very selfish creatures. From an early age, what's one of the first words A child learns. Mine. 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 
And from an early age, we are selfish. Can somebody close those wonderful doors that we have there? Because I'm like a squirrel. I get distracted like that. And uh, I'm distracted. Uh, It goes against our nature. The survival nature. Hey, if nobody's looking out for me, if, if I'm not looking out for me, nobody else will. Right? I'm sure you've heard that before. But if we take self out of the picture, everything changes. The whole dynamic of our life changes when we take self out of the picture. In Sunday school, I I dabbled into my sermon a little bit here, so uh, you might get a double dip here uh, at some point, but we take self out of the picture, everything is different. You take self out of the picture, materialism holds no weight. The car I drive, the suit I'm wearing, the house I live in, the flat screen I have on my wall, none of it makes any difference. The watch on my wrist, the phone in my pocket, it makes no difference. You take self out of the picture, you look at things differently. I'd say one of the the most rewarding things about, I want to say the most, one of the great rewarding things that happened being in a third world country was being under the innate realization that materialism doesn't mean anything. When you go into a village that you have to walk half a mile to a mile on a footpath, there's not even a a road where a vehicle can drive back. It's a footpath with grass this tall on the sides. And you don't know if there's snakes or baboons or you don't know if any, whatever. And you're walking on this footpath back into the bush to a village to tell people about Christ. And these kids come running out of a mud hut, a six foot by six foot mud hut with an ear to ear grin on their face. And they're the happiest kids in the world. When all they have to eat for the day is some some porridge for breakfast, a little bit of rice for lunch. If, If they're wealthy, maybe a chicken leg too or a chicken wing. Most of the time, just like two meals a day or something. Next to nothing. And they're the happiest people in the whole world. And you sit there, and and it's so convicting that we have so much, and yet we're unhappy. We're still reaching out for what we don't have. When we remove self from the picture, we look at things differently. The focuses that we have hold no purpose, no value. What are some of the focuses that society has? Help me out here. What are some of the focuses that society has? What's that? Money. If you're not making money, what are you doing? Fame. Hollywood, success, fame, money, success. Money's not a bad thing. The love of money is. Money's not a bad thing. But when it consumes you, it is. But these focuses on these things, they hold no value in life. doing things to stay young, vitamins, Botox, gym memberships. And I'm not saying don't work out. I'm saying when you're spending four hours a day, seven days a week, 
you're probably taking it a little far. At one point, we're all going to die. Security. How much focus do we put on security? The biggest budget item in our nation's budget, self-defense. I'm not saying we shouldn't have self-defense for a country. But just think, all the focuses that we have. Security in, oh, a focus in security in a steady job. Work 30 years at a job, stash away money and retire. That's a huge focus that we have in society. Getting caught in the hamster wheel. Working overtime or side jobs so we can have bigger and better things. So many people around us in life, you see they're just roaming through life. Oh man, I can't wait till I get to retire and I'm going to go fishing. And I'm not knocking fishing because I love fishing. But that's what they're living their life for. They work a job that they don't even like so that they can retire so that they can spend the last 10 years of their existence fishing. What kind of life is that? I mean, we we have to ask ourselves, when are we going to remove self from our grand perspective? And I'm not saying retirement is bad. Hey, retirement's great. If I didn't have to go to work every day, I could do, I could serve God nonstop. Hey, that'd be great. I still have the opportunity to serve God at my job, tell others about Jesus at my job. But what's driving us? What's our purpose in life? I'm not going to go work at a refinery or at a steel mill for 30 years so I can go fishing the rest of my life? What is it that's driving you? What is it that's pushing you forward in life? People around us roam through life with little to no purpose or direction. Living for the next ball game. Hey, preseason baseball started. Yeah, go Cubs, right? Uh, Living for the next race. I love racing. I don't know about you. I love racing. What's that? (laughs) Uh, Live for the next show on television, the next Netflix binge watching that we have ability. time that we have, the next vacation, the next adventure, the next upgrade on vehicle, gadgets, or lifestyle. Our focuses are so on self. I'm guilty of it. I, I'm preaching to myself here this morning. I'm human just like you. We, the flashy gadgets, the, oh, you've got to have this. You've got to have the new this. You've got to have the new iPads, the new iWatches. And we get drawn in. And we start focusing on these things. I was listening to a sermon this week. I used a great illustration. I'm going to copy it. He said, what if, picture this, we're at a football game, all right? Team huddles. All right, that's what we're going to do. You're going to take five and post. You, you're going to do it, a ten and out. 
And you're, you're going to do a slant across the middle, all right? Ready, break. And the whole team goes down. <sighs> Sits on the sidelines. It's going to get awkward real quick. Time clock runs out. I'll get back. All right. All right. Here's what we're going to do. All right. All right. All right. Tight end, you're going to go five and out. This wide receiver, you're going to go ten and slant. You're going to cut across, go to the far post. All right. You, you're just going to do a, a ten and a button hook right there. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you. All right. Ready? Break. Now go back to the sidelines. <sighs> Sit down. What are people going to start thinking of them? The other players on the field, these guys are crazy. Spectators in the stands, eventually they're going to start leaving. Well, I didn't pay this money to watch this. Man, that was a good huddle. Good call on that play. Play clock, clock runs out, they go do it again. They go sit on the sidelines. Many of the churches around America, that's what we do every week. We huddle up. Hey, Jesus loves us. Hey, we need to tell others about Jesus. All right, hey, you're going to tell somebody? You're going to tell? All right, all right, pray, break. Oh, hold on. I got a Facebook message. Hmm. Wonder what Randall's doing today. Let me look. And this is how we live our life. Huddle the huddle. Our quarterback is out there standing in the middle of the field half a team. Jesus standing up there. Hey, is anybody going to go long? I can't. Where's my running back? I want to hand the ball off. And we're, man, that's a cool show on Netflix here. And we're so sidetracked with self, our selfish desires. I am too. I don't knock on enough doors as I should. If we're being trans, can we be transparent this morning? I don't knock on enough doors. I don't tell enough people about Jesus. I'm not trying to beat you down this morning. I'm trying to challenge you. Hey. We've got to make a change. We've got to do something differently. If we read the Bible and we don't make any changes, the Holy Spirit's not working in our life. We have to let the Holy Spirit work. If we're not willing to change, that's a problem. Our lives should be filled with, okay, what does the Bible say? All right, I'm going to have to do that differently. I'm going to make a change. Instead, we, we hang on to these things that mean nothing in the grand scheme of life. Mean nothing for eternity. The clock is winding down, Christian. There's no clock reset. We don't get a do-over. They're not going to call a timeout. You know, we're going to review the play, and we're going to put a minute back on the clock. No. When our time is done, it's done. When it's time for God to call us home, our time is up. It's up. So we look at this 
Complacency, we ask, what is the cause? All right, if we are to change something, we have to see the root problem. We have to see what is the cause. So what is the cause? Is it, I'm not reading my Bible enough? Is it, I'm not praying enough? Is it, I'm not going to church enough? Is it, I'm not telling somebody about Jesus enough? We talked about this just a, a touch in Sunday school. The problem is the lack of a relationship with God. You see, we have a belief. We wouldn't be here if we didn't believe, all right? We wouldn't be, quote-unquote, wasting our time if we didn't believe that Jesus is who he said he was. We wouldn't be here if we didn't believe he died on the cross, paid for our sins. We wouldn't be here. But it takes more than just a belief for our heart to actually do something about the Holy Spirit residing inside of us. See, I can walk away from a belief. I don't believe that anymore. But if I have a relationship, He is my heavenly Father. I can't say, oh, (laughs) you're not my dad anymore. (laughs) No. He is forever my Father. There's nothing I can do. The Bible says when, when, when I trust Him, He puts me in the palm of His hand and no man can pluck me out of the Father's hand. He is my Father for ever, eternity, never ending. I can't leave that relationship. And if I'm tied into that relationship, you're not going to see me falling off the bandwagon if I'm tied to this relationship. You're going to see works that back up my faith Because works are an an outward manifestation of an inward change. The Holy Spirit is working in me, therefore, I am doing the works of the Father that sent me. The works aren't what get me saved, but the works are the manifestation of the Holy Spirit working inside of me. The Holy Spirit living inside of me. And this causes us, when there is no relationship We do not have a healthy fear of God. This is one of the biggest issues in the modern church today. People do not fear God. I don't get it. I see it, but I don't get it. There's a belief that there's no relationship. Proverbs 1 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. How many times have you heard another Christian say the term, Oh, don't judge me? Don't judge me. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. If I'm speaking truth into your life, if I'm sharing the words of God with you, I'm not judging. That's the Holy Spirit poking at your heart. That's the Holy Spirit digging in saying, hey, Randall, you need to make a change. Hey, Dave, you need to make a change. Hey, Don, you need to make a change. Mark. You need to make a change, and it doesn't feel good. It doesn't. Because we get, we get complacent, we get comfortable, and nobody likes to go outside their comfort zone. But then that Holy Spirit starts digging his finger in there, and he's like, you've got to make a change. My word says this, you've got to change. And that's when you see people slide off. Yeah. I don't want to make that change. You see them stop coming to church. 
You see them stop telling others about Jesus. And you see their lifestyle start going down. Now, the Bible says we're supposed to be different. They stop being different. They start hanging around the people that bring them down. All because they're comfortable. They didn't want to change. There's a belief, but there's no relationship. When we truly meet the Lord, when we see him for who he is, we fear him. If you look at the different saints in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 12 tells the story about Moses. When he saw the Lord, he said, I exceedingly fear and quake. I said that the voice of God shook the ground when he went to the mount to get the tablets, Ten Commandments. Isaiah chapter 6. Turn with me if you would to there. Isaiah chapter 6. Power, powerful verses here. what the prophet Isaiah had to say. Isaiah 6, we're going to look in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. With twain he did fly. One cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is The Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He says, Woe is me, I'm undone. The great prophet Isaiah great man of God. And he said, I am undone. I can't think straight. I can't function. I'm beside myself. I am undone because I have seen the Lord. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 17, John fell at the feet of Jesus in his glorified body as if, as if he were dead. These are people who have seen the Lord for who He is. Job chapters 40 through 42 give the outline of how Job is talking back, back and forth to God. And in Job 42, verses 5 through 6, Joseph says, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. He says, I've heard of thee, and now I see. He says, I, have, I can't even stand myself because I see you for who you are. If we have this relationship with God, we will see him for who he is, and we will fear him. One day, we will all stand before God and give an account. Romans 14, 11 through 12. It says we will give an account of ourselves. An account, a reason, a rationale of why. Why, we did, why, why are you doing this? What is your life about? Matthew twelve thirty six says we give an account for every idle word. That'll shake you to the core. If he is not real to us, 
If he's only a belief and not a relationship, then his judgment doesn't hold as much clout as it should. Wow. As I'm going through this, as I'm studying this, I'm like, oh my goodness. You know that pit you get in your stomach? A little bit of cold sweat you get going on? Yeah. Reading these passages, re-going through these truths. I got it again right here, right now. I got this cold sweat going on. Because we need to have a healthy fear of God, of who He is. The Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation at times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. It teaches us that what Christ did for us and what we are to do. We are to be changed. We are to be new. Our lives are to be different. It says, I I knew you were going to get saved before the foundations of the world. So I ordained you. I said, I'm going to set this person aside for my service to do good works. Colossians 3, 9 and 10 tells us to put off the old man and to put on the new man. Boy. God's to be working in our heart, in our life, in our mind. It's a relationship is what cultivates this to actual happen, the change to take place. So we've identified the root problem. We're each to have our own relationship with God. Some of us need to stop writing the coattails of someone else's faith. Whether it be a pastor or a Sunday school teacher, a televangelist, a friend, a parent, a spouse. My daughter, Casey, is going to one day stand before God she's going to have to give an account for herself. So she's going to want to have a relationship with Christ. Ryan, you can't live on the coattails of your granddad's faith. You've got to have your own faith. Same with you, Andrew. we got to have our own faith. One of the things that uh, people around me growing up, they didn't get. And I'm not saying I'm better. Than, I'm not. I just happened to catch the fact that I couldn't ride on my, the coattails of my parents' faith. 
And so individuals, friends, friends, acquaintances that I grew up with, kids that I graduated from school with, some of them don't even go to church anymore. It's because they never started that relationship. They believe that Jesus died for their sins. They punched their ticket. They never started that relationship. And so now, 18 years later, they still don't have a relationship with Christ. It's a choice. People will walk away from belief. Not so much a person. What are you going to tell God? You're not my dad anymore. No. Hey, son. It's time to eat. Go eat. <laughs> you can't leave your father when he's actively pursuing you. God is actively pursuing us. He wants to have that relationship with us. He says, seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth, and everyone that seeketh, they'll find. Everyone that knocks the door will be opened unto them. Jesus says, deny self. Pick up our cross and follow him. The invitation is simple. We need to put ourself aside. Put ourself aside and follow him. Our whole outlook on life will change if we stop looking at self. Get out of the mirror. Stop looking in the mirror. Stop looking at yourself. Let's look at him. Our life, besides serving Him, we have to get this, because the Bible says that if, if we lose our life for His sake, we'll find it. If we keep our life, we'll lose it. So outside of a life in service for Christ, our life has no value. That's why it's so important. That's why people are are always searching, tipping the bottle. They're they're trying to fill a God-sized hole with all these things that won't fit, that won't fill this God-sized hole. Only God can fill the God-sized hole in our life. And without service to Christ, my life doesn't have meaning. I'm just wandering aimlessly through this life if I don't have a purpose, if I don't have a goal in serving Christ. Oh, we're making money. We're getting famous. See the new new car I got? What's our goal? What's our focus? We need to refocus. Refocus our dreams, our goals in life. Let me challenge you this morning. Hey, let's step back. Husbands and wives, sit down. Sit down. Have, a, have this conversation, all right? What, where do we want to be in 10 years? Usually you can't ever predict where you're going to be in 10 years. But say, what do I want it to look like? And the first focal point must be, what am I doing for Christ? 
Okay? What does he want me to do daily? He wants me to walk with him daily. He wants me to meditate on his word. He wants me to tell others about him. He wants me to serve. He wants me to do good. Okay, so if I do his will today, he'll take care of the 10 years down the road. But we need to sit down and say, hey, we need to reassess our family goals. We need to center them around God. Stop putting God at the, at the tail end of your day. Uh, he gets the leftover time. You know what? If, if, if I got time, I'll spend 30 minutes in the day with God. Oh, if I got time, you know what? I'll give him 15 minutes. I'll, I'll pray with him on my drive, on this errand I got to go to. The guy gets left out. Hey, instead of cheaping God out of time, you know what? I'm going to skip watching my Netflix episode this evening. I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip the ball game this evening, and I'm going to spend time with God. How different would our lives look if God was actually the center of our life? Oh, we would look at things so differently if we take self out of the picture. That's my challenge for you this morning. How am I serving Christ today? How are my thoughts and actions promoting him today? How are my goals and dreams aligned in service to Christ? Our time clock is running out. We only have so much time in this life. The Bible says this life is but a vapor. Are we on the field playing in the game? Or are we just super busy on the sideline, on the bench? Let's get in the game. Let's serve Christ. Let's put our focus around the things of God. Let's get back to a relationship with Him. You say, you know what, brother? I've, I've never really had a relationship with Him. You know, I trust in Him as my Savior. I've never really had a relationship. Okay. Let's work on it. We'll start, we'll start by, by, by reading Scripture and by praying. By leaning on him for wisdom. He says, if you seek me, you'll find me. If you seek me, you'll find me. This morning, stop looking at ourselves. Stop focusing on ourselves. Let's look to him. Let's look to him. Let's all stand.